Just being right. drafted. Uh, run us from there. You're drafted and then where? Well, they had options when you got drafted then. If you want to go to the Navy, Air Force, or Army, and uh, the, the best deal, both my buddy thought, would be the Army Specialized Training Program, ASTP. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we went to that. But uh, we had the experience of being pulled out of that uh, and sent right down to Fort Benning for infantry training. They were planning the invasion, I'm sure. So <coughs> we spent the winter down in Fort Benning, Georgia. <coughs> and then we got split, but we went to different, different outfits. And then uh, I went from there to Camp Livingston, Louisiana, for sort of the summer. And uh, as soon as fall came, they shipped us up to Fort Meade, Maryland, and on our way overseas. Right. And then overseas, you were stationed where? Uh, well, we're stationed anywhere. It just belongs to an outfit that kept moving. <laughs> true, true. <laughs> replacement. We went to a replacement depot, and they <coughs> put us in the 1st Infantry Division, 26th Battalion, uh, 26th Regiment, 3rd Battalion. And, uh, and in November, that was in October, November 19th, I got wounded, spent three months in the hospital. Is this 42 still? or This is 43. 43. And I had to be 44. 43 went in and 44 went across in October 44. Uh, D-Day was the 6th of June, 6th of June in 44. And uh, in November of 44, 19th of November, I got wounded, spent three months, spent in the hospital in England. And, uh, How'd you get wounded? Explain shrapnel. Shrapnel? In the Hurtgen Forest. They uh, th throwing 88 millimeter you know, artillery at us. Mm -hmm. And uh, it hit all these tall pine trees in the Hurtgen Forest and just simply rained down shrapnel. Mm -hmm. Do you know where that is? Where is the Hurtgen Forest? Is oh, I have to look at it on a map. I'm not sure. It's on, not too far from the Rhine. It's, on the, it's west of the Rhine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I missed the Battle of the Bulge. I was in the hospital all during the Battle of the Bulge. I've never really talked to a guy who's been wounded. When you got the shrapnel, what was your first reaction? Like, I've been I'm hit? Gone. Oh, yeah, I'm gone, yeah. In fact, all the, everybody in our squad got either hit or uh, wounded or blasted into the air. And uh, when I came back three months later, I swear it was the same place where I got wounded. Are very similar, right? And uh, from then we took on and went to the Hearts Mountains. We got some close calls there, and then uh, we got into Patton's Third Army, and he took us all across through Thuringia, and we ended up in Czechoslovakia at the end of the war. Mm -hmm. the Western end of Czechoslovakia. When you heard <coughs> that there had been a surrender, well, that's why uh, Roosevelt died in April. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure, I think it was the 25th of April in 45, mm -hmm. and we knew that the, the war was ending anyway. It was going to wind down, though it was back another few weeks before it did. And uh, I just remember being very pleased that we were uh, coming to an end of the war, uh, the violence. Mm -hmm. And in, uh, May, in, in May, just the week after the war ended in May, the battalion commander was a John T. Corley, uh, lieutenant colonel, and uh, <clears throat> he wanted to, he heard of this Theresa Neumann, who was a stigmatic in Germany, in the eastern part of Germany, and so he took a jeep load of four of us over there and we, we met, talked with her, mm -hmm. saw her with her wounds, her hands, her head, and the father neighbor was her pastor, and uh, then it wasn't long after that before we were shipped the whole outfit was sent back to Ansbach, uh, south, uh, north of Munich mm -hmm. in Germany. And from there, <coughs> the, the, the uh, beginnings of the Nuremberg trial were taking shape, and uh, the battalion commander assigned me to be protector for Robert H. Jackson. Let's stop here and kind of Just make sure nothing happened to him, though. Yeah. So, did he explain why he was given that responsibility of finding somebody for Justice Jackson? Uh, I don't know. Uh, our, our whole outfit was responsible for the uh, cleanup of Nuremberg. We were in charge of all the SS prisoners. We had to start cleaning out the streets of the 
streets to be passable. Uh -huh. The place was literally full of rubble. Right. And, uh, and he said he, he was given responsibility to protect the chief prosecutor when he came. And he said, you're the guy, make sure nothing happens to him. <laughs> and I was, I was given a 45. Up until right. then, I'd get her a rifle a long time. An M1 rifle, I'd get a 45 and a blackjack in my pocket. And you were to carry that at all times? Yeah. And then it wasn't long after a few weeks, I was given a 357 Magnum instead of that, because they put that under, under my armpit. Now, had you been a marksman? Had, had you achieved any sort of uh, well, with distinction? With a rifle, yeah. Yeah. Pistol, you don't get be marksmanship with that, because that just blows out of your hand every time you shoot it. <laughs> but 357 was good. But I did have a good experience <clears throat> among the different things we did as a, a court team. Jackson and Douglas and myself with a driver. Uh, on Sunday afternoons, we go out for a drive once in a while. Like we went to Rothenburg. One day, one time, he had scheduled to want to go to a hunting trip. So he had, I don't, don't know, four or five, half a dozen maybe in the party. But I was the only one that got a deer. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> so that made Jackson feel good. <laughs> you know, he had somebody who could hit something. Now. <laughs> the deer, of course, a lot smaller over there than the other called a ray. Ray? Right. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's and good. Jackson cleaned the deer. He gutted it and skinned it, did the whole thing himself. Well, I think he that's probably it. his background in Frewsburg, New York. He, okay. he did those things. Okay. Um, okay, I'm going to go spend a little bit of time on this. Um, so now Donna Risk and he falls. Just the Can you tell what the story is? What's going on? The story is that there's a fox in the middle That's of the, the road. Of a fox hunt, yeah. There's a fox hunt. They can't get to the fox. You got it. That's it. That's the whole thing. It's, it's the effect that civilization has had on tradition. Yeah. That's the, the, there. the picture. The fox is safe. And the fox hunters are frustrated. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Our name, Fuchs, means fox. Means fox. No. Oh, I don't want to eat that to get This is a floor. nice. This, I'll put it over here where it will be safe. Now, <clears throat> General Cleary, right? Was it Cleary that had uh, appointed you to take care of Jackson? Corley. John, Corley. John T. Corley. He was a battalion commander of this 3rd third Battalion, 26th Infantry, 1st mm -hmm. Division. And did he explain why you, of all people, Moritz Fuchs, would be the lucky guy? No, did you? He just, gave it, he just gave me the job. I had... Uh, I, my Swiss background gave me some familiarity with the German language, mm -hmm. so the parents spoke a Swiss German, a di Swiss dialect, and it was never promoted among us. Uh, we were never encouraged to learn it, but there was enough of it going on at home, especially when these three brothers got together with their families. Right. And uh, when I was in the hospital, I got a hold of some army booklets on German language, German phrase books. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so I, when I got back to the front, I uh, hinted around that I could be a help maybe in translating or interpreting for prisoners. Sure. And so he took me off the front line, brought me back to battalion headquarters, put me on a bazooka squad, kind of one of these, we'd call them SWAT teams kind of thing, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, I figured that saved my life because the next time we had... Uh, a gathering of troops. The guy who took my bazooka ammunition was on a pile of bodies. Oh, God. Yeah, shrapnel had exploded yeah. the bazooka bag. Oh. Carried three rounds of bazooka ammunition, and that was the end of him. Yeah. Is there a point where you're introduced to Bob Jackson by the general? I don't remember that detail at all. Yeah. Uh, Had you known anything about Jackson beforehand? No. And again, I was, what, 20 years old at the time, so... Yeah. so Your first impression? In the Supreme Court, you know. Yeah. And uh, I'm not even sure whether, I know, whether it was Roosevelt or Truman. Uh, Truman took over, but whether Roosevelt had already set him up to do something like that, I'm not sure. It was Truman. It was Truman. Yeah. But that would be in 30, after April right. 45 then. So, what's your first impressions of him? Uh, a gentleman. Mm -hmm. uh, well dressed. 
cultured. Describe him. Genial. I thought he was well, uh, well educated. Uh, just a, a, a gentleman. Mm -hmm. That's the best way to wrap it up. Size wise, <clears throat> size wise, uh, medium height. Uh, um, I've, I've never thought of how much he weighed or something like that. I know I managed to keep my weight pretty much the same as I was then, but a uh, uh, benign fatherly figure, uh, obviously a man of capabilities, otherwise he wouldn't have gotten to the Supreme Court. Sure. Did he accept you as a bodyguard? Did he want one a bodyguard? I don't know whether they asked him, I just said they just, that they had to take care of him. Right. Uh, it was a foreign country, war, and whatever going on. Uh, he was pleased, mm -hmm. <clears throat> as you can see some of the, some of the pictures in the uh, album that he gave me after it was all over. Uh, there were a couple of drivers, two or three cooks, that were assigned when we lived out in uh, Firth, Dombach, was a post, post office mm -hmm. address where we lived. Talk about where you did live. What was the address? Remember? All I remember was first Dombach. I don't know a house number. It may show on some of the pictures, but I never had any use to know that. Describe the house. House of Stucco. Mm -hmm. There were two stone pillars at the entrance when you came in. They were right on the road, on the street. It was a street, not a road. And uh, a short driveway, and uh, there was a a glassed-in room to begin with. There were steps walking up, and the room off to the right was where I where I lived. I just had that one single room. Uh, inside there was a a, a, medium, a, a welcome room. I'd say you call it a, a common room, or a, and then uh, beyond to the left was a kitchen. Uh, there was a stairs going upstairs where there were at least three or four rooms. And that's for Jackson, mm -hmm. and uh, two. One, and there'd be at least two two visiting rooms. I know when Bill Jackson came, he stayed up there, and Elsie Douglas, and they had a, a common room up there too. Mm -hmm. Was that a work location? Aside from a residence, did they actually work there? Oh yes, yeah. They have offices. Yeah. Well, he made them. Into the, that would be what I would call a common room or a living room. They mm -hmm. made into an office. Yeah. Yeah, he didn't have any other place to work at besides that, or the office down at the trials. Mm -hmm. So in the house itself would have been Bill Jackson, Elsie Douglas, Bob Jackson, and you. Myself. And I don't know that the housekeeper lived there. I'm quite sure it's Mrs. Hassel. I think she and uh, another girl probably would come there, but I don't think they were allowed to live there. I'm sure they were. Yeah. Yeah. So and then it was a groundskeeper as well. I remember him because he was sort of a portly guy, and yet he was proud that he could still do cartwheels. And he, of course, he tried to pull the, the things that a lot of the Germans did, you know, how poor off they were yeah. at the time. And he wore a pair of large pants and showed how this stuff had I was before. <laughs> <laughs> So the grounds itself was it pretty was it sizable grounds? Uh, well, there was an outbuilding, a kind of uh, patio building, separate from the house, and there was a tennis court, either tennis or basket or uh, volleyball. I guess we I'm not sure. More, I guess it was a volleyball court was part of it. Uh, Did gardens or anything like that? Uh, I think it was just well landscaped. I don't remember any gardens. Mm -hmm. How big was it? Do you remember? Do you have a guess at how many square feet? For I wasn't thinking that way at all. Oh, at that that time. Did it feel big? Does it feel it like a felt, big place? It felt like a comfortable, not a, not a terribly large place, but really comfortable. Yeah. Yeah. What's what was it? Okay, let's time wise. You would have joined with Jackson around when August summertime. Um, 
probably July, I would say, July or August of 45. Okay. Whenever he came over, soon enough, whenever he came over, mm -hmm. uh, I had to be there to make sure that he could, nobody took any pot shots at him. What was, what was a daily, give me a normal day at the life of Robert Jackson. You, was there, was there a time schedule where you, what you said, well, it's, you know, at uh, 10 o'clock we're going to court. Did, did he give you a schedule? Uh, really didn't. At least I don't have any impression of being disciplined like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sure that, I don't I, now that we now to think of it, they probably had meals upstairs, but I'm not sure. I just know that uh, whenever he was ready to go, I would have had my breakfast and was ready to go. Mm -hmm. Did you drive at all, or you just? I didn't drive. Okay. I, uh, we had our 16-cylinder Mercedes at his disposal, also a smaller American car, and I'm not sure who used that, but I don't remember ever being in that. Uh, I remember it was one of the first cars that had uh, a retrieving steering wheel. That is, on the earlier cars, you had to pull the wheel around again. You made a corner, you had to pull it back around again. This was on a recovering yeah. wheel, steering wheel. But the, the Mercedes had belonged to von Ribbentrop. It looked like a Packard in the front with a cut front Packard, mm -hmm. two rows of eight, leather upholstery. Uh, the the uh, dashboard looked like an airplane cockpit. Oh, there. Room for seven people in the back. The top folded down, uh, black. Once when, our, wait, once when we were driving, on the Autobahn, we had a flat tire, the right rear wheel, and uh, the the hubcap simply spun off. That helped to hold the wheel on. The hub, hubcap was the the one big nut that hold it on. No and when you took the tire off, there were tube tires. There wasn't a fragment larger than your thumbnail. Oh, it simply disintegrated. But we had it up to 120 miles. One at 200 kilometers at one time. Wow. Oh, 75 gallon tank capacity, two tanks, and uh, the supercharger kicked in at 40. Those are the only details I remember about that, but it was, I would have loved, we only got about three or four miles to a gallon. I would have loved to have had the access to the car to drive in when I came home. But they just don't make them like they used to, do they? That 75 gallon tank? And well, they needed, but they didn't have much, didn't get much, much mileage on it, yeah. yeah. Where, where did you sit? Near the driver. Near the driver. Yeah, next to the driver. And then Jackson, and Jackson and Elsie and anybody else who was going to the office would sit in the back. Of, like I say, they had room for seven. Yeah. There were uh, three in the seat and four jump seats. Were there frequent guests? Not frequent, but often. Uh, you know. yeah. And so they often had good conversation going in back with three or four people. And so. You saw that he got into the car, and you were probably the first guy out of the car when mm -hmm. he moved in? And walked with him into the, to the uh, to Justice Building. And when you walked with him into the Justice Building, did you uh, did you have to show your pass, just like everybody else? No. Yeah. Got to be known. Yeah. yeah. At first, I wore the regular uh, 26th Infantry uh, medallions and the 1st in, first Division shoulder patch. but. Uh, after what maybe after a month baby or something like that for a few weeks uh they just had me wear a plain uniform with no insignia at all so i'd be less obtrusive or less right. identifiable mm -hmm. because all the all the secretaries and all the other personnel that were uh, civilians wore a, a plain army uniform so on a, on a nor again a normal day you'd go from the house drive to the palace of justice and, and there, escort him into the Palace of Justice. And, this, and I would be in an outer office. Mm -hmm. This was on the second floor. And it would be on an outer office uh, while there, I think there were two offices inside. And uh, I'd, I'd just be in charge. They'd let me know who was supposed to be coming in. Or Would they have to go through you to go visit him? They'd have to go by me. Yeah, they didn't have to, I didn't have to interrogate them or anything like yeah. that, no. Who was the gatekeeper for Justice Jackson? Uh, on the second floor, 
if somebody wanted to go see him, who did they make the appointment with? Elsie uh, Douglas. Yeah, yeah. Give me your describe Elsie Douglas. I don't think I've ever heard anybody describe her. Beautiful woman, charming. Uh, uh, she wasn't thin. She was, wasn't really stocky either, but she was just pleasantly plump. Mm -hmm. Uh, had a very pleasant, very uh, great disposition. Uh, looked like the epitome of a, an efficient secretary in those days. Mm -hmm. uh, easy to talk with. Yeah. Now, what, was I found her very pleasant. She, uh, we got along well enough so that when I was ordained, she came to Syracuse for the ordination, and came here and stayed here wow. uh, for my first mass that Sunday. Terrific. That must have been quite an honor to have her. I was very pleased, yeah. yeah. Did you keep in touch with her after that? I regretfully that I didn't know. Uh, we, I think we spent sent Christmas cards for quite a few years, but that would be about it. Mm -hmm. did, um, did you have, but just an aside, did you, you didn't happen to go to Jackson's funeral, did you, when he died? Didn't know, didn't know about it. Okay. I would have been in the seminary. We, I did visit him at the Supreme Court early on when I was in Washington. Mm -hmm. I, I stayed, I studied at Catholic University for my last four years. Mm -hmm. Interesting. But, uh, let's fl I'm sorry to get aside there. Flashing back to how the Palace of Justice was set up, you're on the second floor, you have an outer room. If Greg Peterson wanted to try to get to see Justice Jackson at the second floor at Nuremberg, what would be my protocol? How, how would I even get access? To by telephone, I mean, I'm sure. Yeah. By telephone, you'd have to make an appointment and working through Elsie. Right. Yeah. So she was the. Were there any other secretaries that were assigned to him? Not to him. No, there were several. Every, 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 every staff person, I guess, had a secretary. Mm hmm And you would be there with him in his office until, if he went, was called to the courtroom or went to the courtroom. I would be right there. Right there? Yeah. Would you go into the court with him? Mm -hmm. Where would you sit? Uh, in the prosecution section uh, at a table. There were a, a table uh, assigned to each of the four nations that were prominent in this. And then there was a fifth table over t on, the, on the judge's bench side mm -hmm. of, the, of, the, of the five tables that were there. And I would be sitting along that row either at the table or with my back to the uh, visitors or newspaper reporters. Did you... I've did got some pictures oh. uh, where I am where I'm in the picture. Yeah. Oh, terrific. Yeah. Well, I can't wait to see them. Did the other prosecutors have similar bodyguards? I don't know that. There are always uh, there were always several people, what, what uh, staff positions they had, I don't know. Mm -hmm. I would rather expect that the judges did, but I don't know that. So it's not as if you socialized with no. any staff people? No. So while he's in the courtroom, you're in the courtroom? Correct. And he leaves the courtroom, you leave the courtroom? Mm -hmm. I have an interesting picture that a cousin of mine in Switzerland picked up well, it's been about four or five years ago now when they had the 50th anniversary. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for, and uh, I am pictured walking across the courtroom. Obviously, he had just in his footsteps on the way out. I'll be tired. Yeah. You're that, that would have been real early, too, because I was, at that time I was still wearing the uh, military uniform, mm -hmm. first division. Yeah. And then the day is done, you then walk your way out to the car and the chauffeur uh, right, brings the car right up to the door mm -hmm. and we drive off and both coming and going <clears throat> they made a, pi a, a plan anyway of trying to go different routes mm -hmm. so it wouldn't be something anybody could follow all the time. Was there a fear, was there a genuine fear about the safety of Justice Jackson? Well that would be the reason I guess I got the job Right. but otherwise uh, they I remember him saying at one point, if anybody's going to get you, they'll get you anyway. Right. But uh, he didn't have any fear of it, but he was just aware that precautions were worthwhile taking. Mm -hmm. 
Did you have to take any special precautions? Uh, did you do any advanced planning, for example, with the chauffeur regarding routes or any other no, details? No, I didn't have to bother with that. Just yeah. be there. Just be there. So unlike it was a 24-hour job, mm -hmm. you know, for all the time I was there. The only time that I don't that I remember not being with him is when he went back to London. But when he went to Berlin, or when he went to Rome, I was there. Were you there on the skiing trip during the Christmas holidays between 45 and 46? Do you remember going to the... No, I wasn't there. I was back in, back in the States. Okay. Uh, some of the prosecutors were talking about the holiday they had be during the Christmas of 45 and January of 46, going to Garmisch. And the scheme. Okay, I was I was in Garmisch. I have some pictures of there. At one point, even holding an eagle, and, there. and I remember skiing. Okay. But I'm not sure where he was at that time. Okay. Just yeah. <laughs> all the guys talk about it. Did they have fun? Well, they made their own fun. But the only time they really remember a, a break was the skiing holiday. Uh huh. Uh, during the courtroom. When you're in the courtroom, what did you do to pass the time? An awful lot of time was spent in the court. Well, I should ask, did Jackson spend a lot of time in court? Uh, I would say yes, but uh, not a terrible amount of time. He wasn't there most of the time. Mm -hmm. uh, the courtroom was always a focus of attention because there were either uh, arguments going on or presentations. Uh, and listening to what was going on in the different languages, mm -hmm. they had, it was the first time uh, that they had a simultaneous translation kind of thing going mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ad admit it, it does get sort of boring, but legal things are. You go into doing de de details and mm -hmm. hammer the same thing from different aspects, like peening metal. But uh, I was I was fascinated. Did you take notes? No. I wouldn't be able to pay attention if I had done that. <laughs> it also, I don't think it even occurred to me. You know. Yeah. They we ended up with 41 volumes anyway, so I, <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I don't think you missed anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. While you were paying attention, were you principally just watching around Jackson? What, what, what would be your routine as far as from a security perspective while in the courtroom? Uh, just alert, being alert to anything that might seem a bit unusual or out, out of the way mm -hmm. and being prepared to pull this little snub nose out of my pocket, you know, that's all. Give somebody a hard time if they were going to. Sure. And happily, I never had to use either the, the gun or the blackjack. Did you get times where you were a little nervous? No. No? No. Now, did your... Youthful confidence. <laughs> <laughs> Now, did your security extend to Bill Jackson or Elsie? Uh, it, it would, but... Uh, Only if they were in his presence? Yeah. 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 So if you, know, you were not given assignment if Bill was going into town? No, to, no, no, no. What was the relationship at the house between Bill and Bob? Was, was there a lot of interactiveness? Were they just... They, they talk serious legal business and policies and stuff, but uh, and they certainly got along very well. Mm -hmm. There was a good father-son relationship there, as far as I could tell. Mm -hmm. Then, at the courtroom, back to the courtroom now, as you're sitting there, and you're not only looking at Justice Jackson, but you're looking at the 21 defendants and the people you've read about in Stars and Stripes and seen their pictures, what was your reaction when you're eyeballing a Hermann Gehring? What would you think? Did you have an impression? Here's the guy that's been front page center for six years, and now he's right in front of you. Uh, I was impressed that uh, it was good they were caught, and it was good that they were there, and they had this coming. Mm -hmm. And they were getting 
more of a fair trial than any of us would have gotten in our own country, whether it's our USA or France or England, because they use the advantages for the accused uh, of, of whatever country had an advantage. They, mm -hmm. they, had, they had all those advantages, which I thought was uh, more than just. When you go down and you close your eyes and you see the pecking order of the seats and you see Goering and you see Hess and Ribbentrop, any of those folks, it jumps out from looking at this for 10 months, uh, come out and say, gee, that particular individual struck me as, for example, Rudolf Hess. Uh, did, you, did you see his flights of fantasy when he was apparently in the dock looking around and not paying any attention and wondering mm -hmm. whether he was insane. Did you get any sense there? Well, I recognize what most people did. You know, there was, whether he was acting or not, it certainly was flaky behavior. Mm -hmm. uh, the humanity of, of all of them showed through in some way. Mm -hmm. Stryker was certainly a pig. Mm -hmm. uh, the official role that so many of them had especially as officers, was very clear. Uh, in Jackson itself, it's, I was impressed how important uh, a, a single person's uh, ethics and morality was. Uh, for, in, for in the first case, being chosen to take a position like that, and then secondly, in ha his own personal values that came out in uh, this whole world, worldwide program was going on at the trial. Mm -hmm. the, the, the importance of being uh, a, a good person struck me. And then similarly, the, the goodness or the evil uh, in those being accused in the defendants, that was very clear too. Mm -hmm. their, their personal uh, values were being, were being exemplified and challenged. After a particular day at court, you go back in the car, and Justice Jackson sits in the back, you're sitting in the front, and Elsie and or Bill might be with him. Did you talk much about it when the day, when you're heading back, did you get, recall any times where he would talk about the day's activities? I'm, they did, I'm sure, but uh, they were as easily talking about, you know, whether they're going back to the hot Grand Hotel for a, a dinner or something mm -hmm. like that, mm -hmm. or who the guests were. Uh, I don't remember too much about meals. Uh, I would not eat with them. I would, uh, I would eat in the kitchen with the other with the cooks and the drivers. Mm -hmm. And I don't have a picture in my mind, my memory about uh, the dining room there, but I, I, I would be sure now as I think on it, uh, they must have uh, brought food to the dining room for Jackson and the whole company to eat. Was they that have to know ahead of time whether it's going to be three or five or sure. ten people there, you know. Was that fairly normal that after the court proceedings during the afternoon that they would retire to the Grand Hotel? No. No. But on occasion, they would be, mostly they'll go back home, I guess. Back home. I got to read quite a bit there because I, I had that little room off to the, ent off the entrance, mm -hmm. where everybody had to pass by, and you could see who's, any cars that came in or anybody came to the door, they had to go by me. So it was a, a good layout for that. Did Did he talk to you much about what was going on at the trial? He didn't consult me. I wasn't anybody to consult. I was, <laughs> yeah. But did he have reactions like, Moritz, did you see Hermann Goering today? Or, you know, yeah. do, do you believe what happened? Did you ever have any of that yeah, kind yeah, of? Some of that, some of that would come out, but I, again, uh, my, my memories as well as my activities, of course, came to an abrupt end when I went to the seminary, and it was a total change of focus for me. Mm -hmm. So I just got into something else, and that all went back. Yeah. So you're even asking some questions now that I would not have thought of. So. Well, maybe that's good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the, 
you were there at some of, or obviously you were there at some of the more noteworthy events of Jackson's Nuremberg trial experience. For example, the opening statement, mm -hmm. which is revered today as one of the great mm -hmm. pieces of, of literature. When it was being delivered, well, first of all, describe the scene. Describe the scene of the opening statement when Justice Lawrence looks over and says, Justice Jackson, you may proceed. Describe the courtroom. Well, the best I can do is show you a picture of it and say that uh, Jackson, in a very easy, competent, distinctive way, did a great job. Mm -hmm. Did he feel good about it at the end of the day? Uh, I'm sure he, I, I, he did, yeah. I'm sure he did. There were some, some things that happened at different times, and I'm not sure if I could even relate to what, when they were, when he was cut short by uh, long interrogations or something like that. Uh, Lawrence or Burkett or Biddle would end up Sobbing and snubbing a little bit, or something like that. But uh, for the whole trial, I was persuaded that he did. Uh, he was pleased that he had did a good, had done a good job. Mm -hmm. Did he ever react, for example, that that Biddle may have been did not permit the uh, uh, interrogation the way he'd like? Did he ever talk about the personalities of the judges? Uh, not to me. I, I may well have overheard some of that in conversation, either near the, in the office or in the car. But uh, uh, he was large enough. He was a, a great enough man to uh, to overcome a lot of that mm -hmm. petty stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember there was some kind of a uncertainty with the intelligence. And the SOS, I think it was, uh, or OSS rather, I guess OSS. Or, OSS, yeah. Uh, the chaplain, I meant, I meant Walsh over there, and Edmund Walsh. And uh, I remember being poorly impressed by uh, the intelligence service. Uh, which is d developed now into, I don't know what they call it down at Washington. Uh, CIA? CIA. Mm -hmm. That there was, uh, there were at times some elements of personalities there that didn't have any uh, real ethical sense uh, or uh, uh, statesmanship perspective of what's good for the country. They're more or less. Uh, taking care of themselves or mm -hmm. we'll do whatever, we don't care what the repercussions are kind of thing. Uh, and that came up later in well, the Bay of Pigs and talking about assassinating Castro and stuff like that. And right. it seems to me there was a, 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 a lack of uh, what Jackson sent, stood out for me of having a real sense of right and wrong and uh, responsibility and accountability. One of the events during the trial which you frequently see in the documentaries is his cross-examination of Herman Gehry uh, and portrayed as if that probably was not Jackson's greatest couple mm -hmm. of days there. Did he feel that way? Was he frustrated? I, I think he was. I think he was sometime. Uh, maybe he was overcome by the uh, PR on this guy. Uh, and that he wasn't, maybe, yeah, maybe he just wasn't, it wasn't his strong suit, and also that uh, he was limited somewhat by, by the judges, I guess, so what kind of, kind of, kind of things he was going to ask. Mm -hmm. Again, here I'm a 20-year-old kid, so what do I know? Other than seeing the emotions, yeah. perhaps, and, yeah. uh, was Elsie, during this period of time, um, did you see her role principally as a secretarial, or was she also uh, an advisor to Jackson as the, the presentation? Uh, did you see her role, as far as Jackson is concerned, more more than just a typist? 
Oh yeah, more than a typist, but I don't know. Uh, she was when he would make a presentation. She would usually be sitting at the table next to him, right at the stand. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, when someone else was there making a presentation, but he was in the courtroom, she'd be at the table next to him. Uh, so uh, the, she, I'm, she certainly knew what was going on and. Uh, whether she had any say, uh, I'm sure she certainly would, as any one woman would, do give commentary about you know doing this or doing that. Mm -hmm. uh, consultant, advisor, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. Yeah. But I had no clue of uh, some of that movie suggestion that there might have been some. Uh, Affection, kind mm -hmm. of, you know, that sort of thing going on. I, I, I think that's all strictly Hollywood. Mm -hmm. I, 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 I continue to respect them, and they were, I think, thoroughly respectable. Mm -hmm. uh, none of that nonsense going on. No, yeah, well, to comment on it, it would seem like if Bill Jackson's going to be living there at the same place as with Elsie and Bob, it would, uh, it'd have to really be discreet. Yeah, well, I, I don't. Uh, again, maybe I was just naive or anything, but I don't. I was not. Uh, I had would not give them a thought. Mm -hmm. They were upright people. And did you see them? Would you have a chance to see the video? I haven't. I, I'm taking it with me to Florida. Oh, good. And I'm going to watch. I'll have time down there to watch it all together. Yeah, I'll be anxious to yeah. see your impression of the courtroom okay. and all that stuff. How that was put together. Generally, from what I, the little bits I saw of that man who taped it. Tried to tape it for me, and messed it up pretty badly. Uh, I have seen bits of uh, the tape that this man on Hannibal made for me, but uh, uh, I was uh, d uh, disenchanted with it from the very start. Mm -hmm. When they have this Moritz Fuchs from Brooklyn, and he's already a sergeant at that time, you know, and Jackson's coming along in a jeep, which he never had to do, you know. Yeah. I saw <laughs> yeah. that just the other night. Yeah. 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 <laughs> In fact, I, I brought along a, a video, so with a, just a short historical clip, uh, and I think it's a video of you. I, I want to show it That'd so be interesting. just okay. to see if it, that is you. Uh, so we're, we're, if you, it's coming across the courtroom or court uh, uh, outside the courthouse, uh, and it's Elsie, Bob Jackson, and a sergeant. So okay. I'm, I'm rooting for you. But we'll show that. You also were there at his closing statement. So when they're wrapping things up in July, before the judges retire to deliberate on the decision, um, I'm assuming you were still there at the end of the trial, not when the verdicts were given, but at the... Yeah, I was there just yeah, toward the beginning of August. Okay. Because I ride back in the country probably the first week of August. And I came home, I was back here in this place on the 15th of August. So Justice Jackson would have given his final summation around uh, July, sometime okay. in July, okay. where he gave his final statement. And that also is perceived to be one of the great statements as he was able to concisely put together in a four-hour speech, which seems long today, uh, but one where you've got this trial of ten months. Uh, and again, there's... Must have been a large crowd, and um, did you recall that particular summation at all? Can't say that I do. Yeah. It, it would have been announced and acknowledged, you know, before the court that what <coughs> this was. Mm -hmm. But uh, I can't say that I was, uh, you know, overly impressed by it, or mm -hmm. uh, it was just part of. It had been obviously a, a job for that for the whole year, and. Uh, I was impressed by the importance of what was going on, but I don't have any special remembrance well, of that. Along those lines, did you think that you were part of history at that point? Oh, sure. Yeah, I felt good. I felt real good about being the job, and, uh, and my, I had no problem with high morale, for, even though there was quite a bit of isolation there, because uh, here I had been carrying a rifle around most of the time, got shot at, and. Yeah, see, I've seen the bad guys 
and the good guys being vindicated, you know. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was a very good position. <laughs> I saw the, 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 the mud and, and the ice and the snow and the, all the fireworks, and at the same time I got to see the wrap-up of it. Yeah. A, a unique position. It nope. was unusual, yeah. I'm very privileged. <laughs> well, you had the best seat in the house. Yeah, that's right. Tell me about you at Nuremberg when you were when you were assigned the position as Justice Jackson's bodyguard. Did you ever have a sense that when you left Nuremberg you would have a career focus of going into the seminary and becoming a priest? Oh, I didn't really think of becoming a priest until well after the war, uh, and probably even when I had that assignment, mm -hmm. only after I got that assignment. Uh, but I had seen enough of uh, death and damage and uh, suffering uh, that made me think that uh, I, I wouldn't be satisfied being an engineer anymore. The, uh, I don't know how to, how to wrap it up. <clears throat> I remember at different times talking with uh, the Franciscan chaplain from uh, down here near Albany. I can't think of the name of the place now. And, uh, and I talked because I didn't know whether uh, did, I had never even served Mass, so I wasn't sure what becoming a priest would be like. I'm sure my background, I had valued my pastor at that time. Uh, um, Sixtus O'Connor was his name, and then this Jesuit Edmund Walsh from Georgetown, and uh, just asking, oh, should I maybe become a Jesuit or an order priest or a diocesan priest? And I just had some sort of idea because there, there were. All the good men were so much the same, mm -hmm. and uh, the, there was the different effects of uh, the, the war, or experiences like the way the uh, the Russians flooded the market with those uh, uh, what do you call them marks? They had some. They had uh, uh, currency that they were passing out as pay, and we all the four nations used the same money with different serial numbers or something like that, and we were aware of how they had were frustrating things by printing an awful lot on their side that had no backing at all. Uh, how a, a lot of the way the, the Russians came across as a, uh, a coarseness that uh, we were not accustomed to. I, between the uh, uh, trip at, right after the war with a battalion commander to Connors Royce to see the stigmatic, and then going to London, going down to uh, France, Paris, and uh, the Mediterranean, going down to Rome, and uh, seeing what something what life and history was like in Europe, and of course. I hadn't had that much history to know what was going on, but uh, I somehow got a, a summary idea of whatever uh, life is still mine, I'll just put it on the, on the side of good, and I saw it on the side of the church. And I admired Jackson enough to know that, to realize that one person can have an awful lot of influence. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're for good or bad, I decided mm -hmm. for good. And, some of the seminary seemed to be a thing to do. So by the time I got home, I got home in the middle of August of '46, and uh, by September I was in seminary. Had you had any reason to talk to Jackson about what your life? Oh, yeah, yeah, I told him what I was going to do. He was, he was pleased with that. He said, "You know, you're all right." Yeah. Was he a religious man? Uh, I, I he was. I don't know what his church practices were. But he was obviously a, a believer, and uh, I, I 
expect that he would be praying every day. Mm -hmm. So there, you go to the seminary in 1946 and find yourself ordained in 1955. Mm -hmm. And Elsie Douglas is invited and she attends. She does, yeah. Wow. What's the legacy of Nuremberg? As you reflect back now with 50 some years of hindsight. Uh, I, I continue to be impressed that Nuremberg was a good event. Uh, and it put, uh, it called all nations to have some recognition of their accountability as United Nations, mm -hmm. as uh, countries could communicate with one another and recognize there are human civil rules that one has to abide by. Uh, and the accountability was foremost in there that people had to recognize that you just can't do anything. Even though, like, Mugabe is it now in, in Africa, mm -hmm. he's acting like he's not accountable. And that policy they've had of uh, letting uh, blacks take over white farms and just say, well, it's your farm. No, it's not your farm anymore. I, I want it. You're mm -hmm. gone. There's the, that the, uh, obvious injustice and uh, unawareness of consequences. It's being, it's being tested right now there. So Nuremberg has a, uh, put some markers on uh, what is decent and what is expected simply mm -hmm. because we're human. It right. doesn't matter what else you're doing, what, uh, whatever religion you have, but uh, there's a basic human social responsibility we have toward one another. And Nuremberg just put that in focus. That's my impression. That's terrific. <laughs> have you given any sermons on that? anybody ever sat down and, and said, gee, we, you, you've got such a fascinating story to, to just have you write it or preserve it at all? Well, I figured there's been plenty written on it already. Yeah. <laughs> I don't mind making some comments on it, but like uh, that book that Joe Persico wrote. Persico, yeah. Or, or, you know, you know, what else needs to be said? You know, he's <laughs> overload, uh, information overload, I think, is one of our problems today. It's mm -hmm. There's just too much around, too much reading. Have you kept in touch with anybody that you uh, met at Nuremberg? No, I have not. Uh, again, the seminary cutoff was pretty clear. Uh, I did try, since we, since you talked with me at our, a month ago, whenever it was, to try to get a hold of this man down in Florida, uh, who was a driver. And uh, I haven't heard back from him, so I don't know. Another one, I'd like to get a hold of Bob Vlasnik in uh, Chicopee, Massachusetts, but I, I don't know where my old address book is or whether he'd still be there or not. No, his role was? A driver. Driver? Yeah. Did you guys exchange cards and things? We like? did for a while, yeah, and when I was there, I was a chaplain, Newman chaplain, for the first few years, and uh, I didn't meet him at that time. We came. He comes to mind because we we came back together mm -hmm. uh, with Jackson on the airplane. Right. And in fact, we so we stayed together down in Washington or at his uh, Hickory Hill place. And what are the precedents if we were to capture Bin Laden? What would we do with this guy? What are we going to do with these 400 prisoners down in Guantanamo? I don't know. Tell me. <laughs> I have an idea. That was a mistake. You know, I, I can't begin to, but that's the kind of situation that Jackson was put in, you know, what do you do when you got prisoners? Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe shooting them all wasn't a bad idea. Yeah. At least it's all over, you know. Mm -hmm. You might have some arguments after as well what to do, but I can't imagine putting these Afghans, you know, and taking care of them at thirty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. There's something wrong with that, you know. That's right. The, uh, well, it's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a challenge to see what they they, they do with that. Um, I know we interviewed a few of the folks who were the prosecutors and asked everyone the same question. If if Bin Laden is arrested, what are you going to do with him? Well, they're totally, uh, no, there's no sense of consensus. They, 
Uh, Bernie Meltzer was said, gee, I hope he dies an honorable death so we don't have to answer the question. Mm -hmm. uh, Henry King says, well, we've got to have a trial. And Whitney Harris would say, well, if we have a trial, boy, I don't know how we're going to ever find a, uh, a tribunal given everything that's going on, and certainly you've introduced a religious factor into this trial with the Muslims. And whatever we do, it's it's not going to be the same as a rule of law. <laughs> even There was no consensus even among those who were in the front line. Mm -hmm. I remember. Uh, and yet that was a kind of a situation that they were in. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that, uh, which keeps Jackson high in my esteem, you know, right. being able to confront that and come up with a, a very sensible response. He done, he done good. <laughs> he done good. <laughs> can we, it's just all queued up. Uh, John, I don't know if you can get there. But yeah. it's just, is it okay if I put this here? Go ahead, please throw the... The remote is that your left hand works the best thing to turn it on. Okay, well, I see. Oh, I've got it right here. You have to, there may even be one in there. You've got to make sure you push and press the eject and get it out of there. Okay. Let's see here. I'm not sure there's one in there or not. There's something coming in. Yep. That's good. Okay. That's good, yeah. Okay. You've got the remote You put play on it and you'll be all set. Yeah. Get out of the way so you can get a clear shot here. No, Mr. Rogers. Is this yours? Yeah, this is just a <coughs> tape, yeah. But it's yours, okay. Yeah. We return to a special presentation of the History Channel. Each of the four Allied countries had its own prosecutor in Nuremberg. Yeah. Just as Robert Jackson was the chief prosecutor Set for the United States. That, that is not me, no. Thank you. Yeah. No. Robert Jackson was a, a justice on the United States Supreme Court. He was chosen by Truman to head up what came to be officially called the Office of the Chief of Prosecution of Active yeah. Criminality. And he was first the chief American negotiator in the establishment of the <coughs> uh, Nuremberg court system. He was then the American chief prosecutor in the actual trial. On the second day of the trial, Jackson stood before the court and delivered the opening statement on behalf of the international <coughs> team of prosecutors. privilege of opening the first trial in history for crimes against the peace of the world imposes a grave responsibility. Just see at his right side. Okay. And I would be off to the right to rear from where they are. Punish okay. have been so calculated, so malignant and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. <coughs> to convince the tribunal of the guilt of the men sitting in the prisoner's dock, Jackson and his team depended on three kinds of evidence. Does it look familiar? Sure does. <coughs> yeah, it's very deeply in my mind, yeah. They depended upon German documents which had been captured. If you will, the papers of the people who were being prosecuted. <laughs> they, when they ordered prisoners of war to be killed, uh, or people to be mistreated, or other terrible things to be done, the prosecution would present the documents uh, signed by... Uh, the individuals involved. In addition, uh, they produced a small number of witnesses. Uh, for example, the man who had commanded the uh, big killing center in Auschwitz was uh, a witness in the trial. 
The third and the most damaging form of evidence was the you there when they did the film? Nazi mm -hmm. atrocities. I'd be curious to see what you think of this. The Allies had captured both pictures which the Germans had taken and movies which Germans had made. Uh, some of which were official movies and others had been made, if you will, unofficially by Germans of mass killings of all kinds of other terrible things. And then the Allies also introduced as a part of this pictures which they themselves had taken at the end of the war as death camps were overrun and, and so on. When you saw this, With was this your first exposure films, to the Holocaust? Jackson outlined the criminal actions of the indicted men. Well, I've seen quite a bit of pictures Admiral Carl different Zinnick, things, yeah. Accused right. of crimes on the high seas. What you, when you, they were showing this movie Paul on the... On Shaw, the during the trial, did you get a sense of, of to the, Nazi the reaction in the crowd watching this? Julius well, Stryker, anti-Semitic newspaper general publisher, horror, who encouraged you know, the idea and organized of, uh, the persecution of the Jews. Like we saw when the Twin Towers were hit, you know, it can't happen, but it is happening, you know. Right. Yeah, their documentation was good. It was their documentation that uh, convicted them. I think what's amazing about your position at Nuremberg is all these guys we're seeing on the newsreel right here, you saw in person, mm -hmm. and several times. Oh, endlessly. The charges brought to light the unimaginable nightmare. And I couldn't help but think you were mentioning that you couldn't help again just an impression just looking at the guys. Um, ones we all remember, and the most telling charges were those of crimes against humanity because they had to do with the, the running of the concentration camps. And the staff of the International Tribunal had assembled what is still uh, arresting and terrifying evidence of uh, the nature of the concentration camps. And when you're watching this for the first time in uh, 1945 and 46, you got to say, ouch. But well, we knew what was going on. Yeah. Of course, there is a, a horrible aspect of war anyway when you get see people get killed, you know. And one man that sticks in my mind was a civilian who was uh, a man that had a few days' growth of beard and his face been all uh, pe peppered with phosphorus, phosphorus and shrapnel. You know, was, there's no end. To, there's no end to the kind of suffering that we people put up with or mm -hmm. endure in war. And when that's purposely uh, focused on people just to put them down or get rid of them, like they did in the concentration camps, you know, it's despicable, yeah. But that uh, first illustration is not me, no, you're talking, you know. I saw that and said, maybe. I understand that he gave you quite a photograph, or gave you a, you took, you, did you take photographs? No. No? But you, uh... The, the, uh, they gave me a great big album, which I got opened. I was just putting in some of the labels that I typed to, uh, to identify the pictures mm -hmm. being going to fall off, so I started taping them back on this morning. So if you want to look at it. We'd it's love to look at it. Could we look at that? Sure. It'd be terrific. This has been terrific. Come on out in the kitchen. It's where it's the best place to watch sure. that. phone number? Looks like 61117. House 303. Is that right? <coughs> Linden Yeah. It's very interesting. Here's an article from Time. Moritz Fuchs. And then name Marino. 61119. House 304. <coughs> I didn't do all what I was always told though. Destroy all previous issues. <laughs> <laughs>